So Brad Templeton actually stole a little bit of thunder here, but I love this story of New Horizons. Spacecraft was d designed to go to Pluto, and it got there just recently, and we saw these amazing images of Pluto. But what's astounding is that it launched 10 years before it ever made it to Pluto, and some of the software needed to actually image the planet and, and show us all those beautiful images wasn't developed when they launched. In fact, the, the software team was developing their software while the spacecraft was flying to Pluto, and when it was ready, they uplinked it there. And that's exactly what Made in Space is doing, but with hardware. We're making it so that you can send 3D printers into space and not ever have to know what you need until you need it. Imagine a printer that's in space and 10 years later builds something. So what matters is what we build and not really how we build it. How we build it is the, is the magic box. What matters is what we build, not how we build it. And to help that sink in, I'd like to make this analogy. These are the, the women of Apollo. Most people don't know this story. Um, we know the story of the men of Apollo, the first people to walk on the moon, but we, don't, we seldom know the story of all these, the, the women who actually got the men there and got them back safely. The women of Apollo in the 50s and 60s working at JPL had the profession of being a computer. A computer used to be a job, not a device. And they made all the calculations to get people all the way to the moon and back. And the idea of a computer profession was well known, and there was a lot of people who had that job until the technology came along and those people became the users of the computer and the mentor, the guide. They got the things out of the tool that they needed. Today, every single satellite is designed by engineers. That means everything we ever put into space is, has to first be imagined by our brains, and it has to be created with two hands, a mouse, and a keyboard on a computer. Think of the limitations that, that we have on design. But now software is starting to catch up and do more of the engineering for us. So we're working with Autodesk on how to take uh, generative design to, the, to space, where you, instead of having the engineer do all the work, the engineer becomes the mentor to the engineering software, the, the guide, if you will, and describes the problem space, says, I need an antenna that's the size of a football stadium and provides this bandwidth and this shape tolerance and is in this orbit. And the software iterates through thousands and thousands of different options. And it's all done on the cloud and it's all done fast. So where the engineer may come up with three ideas that arguably can be designed in CAD and probably built by hand, the software comes up with thousands of the best solutions and most of them can only be 3D printed. They're just too complex to build any other way. So the future of spacecraft in space is really wild because we design them using software and we, we come up with the most optimal structure, a structure that maybe wouldn't support its own weight in this room because in the software, gravity is turned off. So the best answer is an answer that wouldn't survive launch into space. It only can exist there. So what matters is what we build and not how we build it, but the, the key to join those two is the fact that it's not really about manufacturing that's so important in space, it's about new processes. When we think about feed, giving software in, instructions to design a new space structure, we're teaching the software about the space environment. We're saying, you have weightlessness, you have this solar radiation pressure and all these things, and it's designing based off of those knowns. So what's really happening is we're looking at some new types of processes that we can create in the space environment. And what's really important to understand is that new processes historically have unlocked new industries. And I'd like to share a couple examples. The first one, uh, 17th century England, the, the hardwood birch tree forests are all being just cut down, decimated, because they're being used to, be, to burn them for energy. And England knows that they're running out of this hardwood forest, right? And they know it's a problem and that they have to solve it. They also know that they, in these deep water-filled mines at the bottom is coal. However, there's no way to extract the water out of the mines to get the coal until a gentleman named Abraham Darby comes along and invents a new process called the Coke oven. And the Coke oven allows for the extreme temperatures to create steel 
The steel is used to build pumps. The pumps get the water out of the mines. And now England has access to an abundant source of coal to drive their industry forward. So now with the Coke ovens and coal, more steel is created. And that leads to the machine age, or what we know as the first industrial revolution. So think about that. One new process is invented, and we have the entire industrial revolution. All of the technology we depend on today starts building upon that one set of process. Another example, what do these three pictures have in common? I'm sure all of you know it. OK, right, I'm hearing it now. It's all aluminum, right? And, uh, and Peter gave a really great opening keynote explaining this. But what's amazing is that aluminum is so abundant, right? We crumple it up and throw it away. It's strong enough to make a laptop out of. It's high, uh, high grade enough that we can build our space shuttles with it. And aluminum wasn't always that abundant and that affordable and that um, readily available, right? We know that it used to be something only that kings had the luxury to use. So what happened was a new process was born. Charles Hall, he's age, age 23. He's in his Oberlin College class in Ohio when his professor says, the person to invent a cheap form of aluminum will surely be rich. Charles goes home, his sister's a chemist, and the two of them figure out a way to use electrolysis to extract aluminum from fluoride salts. And then the rest is history. Aluminum becomes one of the most readily used materials on the planet, all because of the invention of a new process. It was always there, it was the new process.